Broadcasting live from the Business Radio X studios in Atlanta, Georgia, it's time for Atlanta Business Radio, spotlighting the city's best businesses and the people who lead them. Lee Cantor here, another episode of Atlanta Business Radio, and I got with me today David Kahn, and he is with a company called Elemica. Welcome, David. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Well, before we Glad get to be before we get too far into things, David, share a little bit about Elemica. How are you serving folks? So oh, Elemica has been in business now for 20 years, actually. We're just celebrating our 20th anniversary. What we've been doing is uh, we supply a digital supply network, and we can get into that. But basically, we were founded by the uh, chemical industry as a software provider to actually digitize all of their supply chain processes so they could answer a basic question on where's my stuff. And so as companies started to outsource business processes, such as logistics or manufacturing or their procurement functions, and as omni-channel kind of order entry and customer service took hold, uh, a lot of these supply chain people, as they started to outsource those to different companies, started to lose the ownership of where their materials were. And so we were started uh, by the industry to actually gather them, connect all the suppliers for our clients, all of their customers and all of their logistics providers, uh, however they move their product across the globe, whether it be by boat or rail car or by truck, uh, and provide them the order and supply chain visibility that they need. So that's how we started, and we've been doing it for about 20 years. We have tens of thousands of trading partners on our network, and we do about a million transactions a day through, uh, through our digital supply network. Now, um, when you started, I, I'm sure there were, um, you know, paper and pencil. People were keeping track kind of in that manner. Are, is anyone still doing it that way? So not so many are doing it that way. It started out when the digitization process started uh, like about 20 years ago. The, the most uh, effective way to do it was through EDI transactions. And that was a problem long term because it, it was a timely, it was costly and time prohibitive for uh, to get companies on board with that uh, approach for digital and integration. And um so it resulted in basically companies integrating their kind of 80-20 rule that 20% of their suppliers or customers or logistics providers provided 80% of that type of their revenue stream. So they digitized that, uh, but it left what I'll call the long tail of suppliers or the long tail of customers and the thousands of uh, suppliers that never got automated until the technology evolved again. So through portals and now integration with portals and integration through APIs and integration with things like Internet of Things type of devices. And so the the world has come a long way. Uh, Even email is now being automated uh, with our solutions with a tool called QuickLink Email. So if you only utilize a supplier with maybe two dozen orders a year, you can now digitize that by simply sending emails back and forth and, and through the network and now be updated to your back end uh, business solutions or ERPS information. So it's come a long way. The technology has come a long way. The business has come a long way and, and the need for uh, based on, based on current events has made it, has made digitization a greater and greater requirement. Now, from a customer standpoint, what is the value that they see? What is this saving them time? Is it saving them money? Does it create more opportunities? Uh, what What is the benefit that they see by digitizing? So initially, uh, it's more around a cost effectiveness, cost efficiencies, manual processes being automated, um, the traditional kind of savings in time and errors in manual entry and, and duplicate entry and those kind of things. But more and more what's happening is it's also being used to move into new markets and new opportunities for revenue growth and new business models are being set up. So companies are starting to take advantage of new go-to-markets like marketplaces and different types of e-commerce activities on how customers are sending them and receiving orders and communicating that. Also, uh, based on the level of data that's actually in the network, companies are able not only to digitize their processes, but they're also able to respond much quicker to the demand fluctuations that we see, whether it be a political strike, whether it be a environmental strike, or in today's market, whether it be 
kind of a virus situation. So we're seeing fluctuations in demand in oil. You know, there's a glut of oil on the market now. There's a, uh, and a shortage of certain types of pharmaceutical equipment, certain types of food and beverage e- equipment, certain types of issues on spikes in demand for consumer products like cleaning supplies and hand sanitizers. So we're seeing the, we're seeing spikes in demand. And as companies over the years have moved to kind of adjusting time inventory levels, these supply chain disruptions, I'll say, whether it be spikes in demand or or risk associated with environmental conditions has caused causes the supply chain to react accordingly, very respond very dynamically. And so by having the network and having this connected supply chain and visibility over that supply chain, both on the demand and supply chain supply side, we're able to react and respond much quicker than we ever have been before. We're also able to see the oncoming responses and look for alternate sources of supply or alternate sources of, of ways to get around it. So it's, it started out as an efficiency story, and now it has moved into more of an analytics and, uh, and a revenue growth story. Now, yeah, I think that um, the more um, this data becomes digitized and available, it allows companies that maybe were – uh, it, it allows them, like you said, to react more dynamically. So like you're seeing it now with these, um, the masks or the uh, the different materials that are needed in this pandemic, uh, companies that weren't producing that but may, might have the capabilities can quickly pivot to adjust and then start producing a material that's in great need pretty much more rapidly by knowing exactly what the need is faster and 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 they can see that hey I can I can jump into this marketplace and solve this problem whereas before the data if it was available or if it was available too slow they would have missed the opportunity exactly exactly and an example of that is you're seeing some of the auto auto manufacturers stepping up and supplying ventilators and you're seeing a lot of companies starting to produce hand sanitizers and you're seeing a lot of companies start to produce a uh, different type of protective equipment like the mask and so you're, you're seeing other companies step up to handle the shortage requirements in the supply chain. And you're seeing those manufacturers also looking for alternate sources of supply that they couldn't get based on even the tariffs or based on other, other supply chain considerations. So is this the, we are able to react much quicker. Now, is this kind of, uh, the, I don't want to say maybe the first time in history, but at this level, at scale like this, is this the first time that this many different um, kind of constituents have this much data at their fingertips to be able to react this quickly. Do you think that the speed of which they're able to kind of uh, dynamically solve this challenge, uh, this seems like to be kind of a unique period in time to allow this to occur this quickly. Is that accurate? Yeah, I think, I think overall the certain industries are more digitized than others, I'll say, so to speak, but they're all coming along pretty rapidly and and the technology is making it easier and easier to connect. But I do think this is kind of a unique time in, in history with uh, where the whole world economy is kind of shut down, so to speak. And working from home has created a whole new culture of work. And one positive thing is that the, by having digitized supply chains, we can actually work more comfortably from remote. Uh, we don't have to be in the office, so to speak. Uh, we know that the supply chain is connected. We know the supply chain transactions are occurring. Different levels of automation are taking place. And so it allows us to work remotely and focus not so much on the execution of the supply chain, but more on the analytics and the causal effects of the, su- of the disruptions in the supply chain. So the execution is being done more and more automatically over time, while the role of the supply chain leader is becoming more of a role of an analytic type of a person. So, so I guess overall, it, this is a unique time period, uh, but it's it's not much different than what we've seen in other periods of time when we were business processing outsourcing, and that was a big issue. On where is my stuff? I don't have control over it. I've now outsourced my manufacturing. Then we start to outsource IT back in you know 2010 and the mobile. And tablets started to explode, and omnichannel became the next greatest thing in the world. And so we had to react to that. And then 
you know, just a few years back, we start to talk about everything going personal and, you know, everything had to be personalization of specific products and goods for growth and connectivity to the customer and everything was personalized and if for, ga- for creating new efficiencies and growth and everyone had to have customized products. And now, you know, before the coronavirus came into effect, the new world was everything was around uh, a safer planet and global, you know, climate control and sustainability and the connected supply chain became a greater requirement for food safety and, and climate control and things like AI and IoT and blockchain became single sentences for many people. And so so things have always been kind of evolving around the digitization of our processes and that will continue to happen. This is unfortunately a very bad disruption, but it will it will pass. Well, it's a disruption, and I think it, when the, when things get disrupted in this manner, this globally, all at the same time, uh, all of a sudden, some companies go, hey, there were opportunities that I missed out on because I didn't have the right um, kind of strategy when it comes to this, and then other companies took advantage of it. I mean, in every market, there's winners and losers, and uh, and then this will be no exception from this side. So from a digitization standpoint on the company, I mean, you probably don't want to do it during the crisis like this, but it probably makes you aware of the some of the benefits of digitizing. Is there a time that makes more sense than others uh, when it comes to digitizing your supply chain? I think, um, no, I, I don't think, I. how do I say it? Um, overall, I believe that it, the supply chain will become digitized and, and it's going to become more and more digitized. And so you can join the digitization world now, or you can wait till later, but it's coming. And, and companies that do not digitize their processes, who do not digitize their supply chain, are, are going to be left behind. You see it, um, you, they're not going to be able to react to the comp- competition and not going to be able to react in terms of speed and responsiveness to retain customers. So it's inevitable that the supply chain become digitized. And we're able to connect different types of devices to that supply chain so that we know where we are and, and any status of it. So I don't think there's any period of time that makes more sense than others. I think that the technology has evolved over time and will continue to, to evolve and it will continue to get easier to connect. And we're already seeing the greater need for just answering that customer question, where, where's my stuff? And so from a customer service perspective, from a logistics perspective, knowing that it's on the highway or it's at the port or it's on a rail car and where it is at any point in time is a great customer service uh, offer. And so I believe that uh, even the way that we order, the way that we make, buy, and deliver our products will all become greater and greater automated. Uh, over time on the execution side. So it's, I don't think there's a time that makes more sense than others. I just think it's going to occur. The technology is coming faster and faster, becoming easier and easier. And certain crises like this make it inevitable. Now, earlier you mentioned the word blockchain. Can you explain to the listeners kind of maybe at a high level what blockchain is and um, its place in this digitized supply chain? So blockchain is, is a type of a network and uh, it's based on a, on a trusted network, trustless network where everyone believes uh, and no one really owns the data. And so it almost works like a, a, a general ledger where every transaction or every movement is, is kind of a journal entry. And so, uh, so it can't be changed. It can't, you can make a, you know, journal entry adjustment, uh, but it's kind of a truth that, um, within the network and the participants. And it's kind of at an early stages. There's different blockchain projects in supply chain that have been going on for many years. The most, the greatest example of success of a blockchain is the Bitcoin um, in the financial services world. In the supply chain, the challenge has always been getting enough participants on, on board uh, in terms of getting enough participants and finding use cases that are non um not that can't be solved with traditional supply chain networks like ours today. So 
we've been working with different chemical companies uh, on blockchain projects. We've been working with different at food and food and agricultural um, uh, blockchain projects, pharmaceutical industry blockchains. But uh, it's still early. I think the the technology is going to get better, the scalability get better, the performance is going to get better, uh, and probably in about ten years we'll we'll actually have stronger blockchain networks. But today's digital supply networks are able to connect to these blockchains and extend the reach of those blockchains to support full, complete, end-to-end visibility. So from farm to table, from uh, consumer all the way back to the type of uh, specifications and food quality criteria being tracked and traced through digital supply networks. So it's not just determining where my material is or where my order is, but it's also tracking the food safety. Uh, Refrigerated cars are providing feedback into the network to say the temperatures aren't correct on a certain truck. And so it's come a long way, and the blockchain is is just a different type or next generation kind of a network um, in the process. Now, it's, I, I bet you it's going to be one of those things where the customers are going to start demanding it, just like you were saying earlier about where's my stuff. They're going to want to know every step of the way, you know, kind of that um, who had it, where to go, or is this batch bad? Where did it, you know, where are the places it's been and, and where did it come from? Um, at some point, the consumer is going to probably demand that level of transparency. I think they're going to, I, I think they're going to, I, I agree with you. I, I, I believe that the consumer or the end customers, even in a biz, business to business world, is going to want to have that full traceability. I don't necessarily agree that they care how they get the how they get that visibility, whether it's a blockchain or not a blockchain. I you know I believe that the vis- the business requirement of or the consumer requirement to know that this uh, food came went through these processes and, and, and certified these, these, these companies is what's important. How, what technology they use to use that, to get that is not as relevant. Uh, they may want to see it on their handheld. They may want to see it on their desktop. They may want to just scan it and see it on their phone. But behind the scenes, that consumer or customer doesn't really care how the data got there. They just want to see the results. Right. Kind of like a control tower, you know. Right. So the technology involved, the AI is, you know, is growing. IoT connectivity is growing. Um, the blockchain is kind of a, a nice technology to watch. Um, but overall, the digitized supply chain is kind of an inevitable um, requirement going forward in the future, and we see that more and more right now. So now, uh, for your company, uh, what do you see happening over the next? It's hard to predict in the short term, obviously, because of this crisis going on. But like, what are the trends you're seeing moving forward in the years ahead? So uh, we're seeing actually right now we're seeing um, our business in terms of overall uh, transactions has not gone up or down. It's kind of seeing you know during this crisis um, uh, we're seeing sort of a level pattern. We're seeing shifts in the types of products that are being moved through the supply chain, but the overall level of transactions is still somewhat um, constant for now. We see certain industries impacting others uh, more so than others. We see, for example, uh, not as many transactions uh, for the automotive industry, but yet we see a spike in the food and farmer industries and consumer products industries. in terms of types of chemicals and types of plastic that are being moved. We also see uh, a good lot in oil for right now. And those transactions relative to movement of oil with, with what's happening with Saudi Arabia and, and Russia, uh, and now opening up the little gates of China. So we're seeing uh, a lot of glut of oil uh, on ships and, and the need for very large oil tankers. Uh, and with no place to put that. So we're going to see a, a storage capacity issue with regard to the oil industry. We've can, kind of been watching that. But overall, um, uh, the business, you know, we continue to um, look at ways that we can help our clients digitize their trading partners, uh, being their customers and their suppliers and their logistics service providers in a much more easier and cost-effective manner as easy as possible, whether it be through EDI, whether it be through portal connections, whether it be through 
emails, faxes, however um, businesses want to conduct their business and operations for orders and shipment. Now, our goal is really to, yeah, then. Now, go ahead. What is your goal? No, uh, you know, our goal is really to continue to support our clients and new clients with ease, ease of digitization and increase the uh, increase their network uh, ecosystem. Now, who's your ideal client? So our ideal client is a manufacturer that is um, in the process-related industries. So whether they be chemicals, food and beverage, uh, consumer products, automotive, those tend to be um, our key clients on a global basis. We generate about half our revenue comes from Europe and the other half comes from the United States. The companies tend to be larger in size. Uh, our main clients tend to be, you know, roughly 500 million U.S. dollars and up. And then their training partners can be any size that want that need to join the network, and we'll connect them in the most cost-effective manner for them. But that type of uh, key client. So we're really focusing on addressing those clients for the and digitizing the their product that they are buying, selling, and moving and complying with through their supply chains. What's the pain they're having where uh, they go, you know what, we got to call those Elemica folks? So the main pain they, that they are suffering is from an efficiency perspective. It's really the not so much the 80-20 rule, but it's really helping really the other thousands of trading partners that are not digitized. And so the work involved in having those suppliers and those customer orders and those uh, logistics service providers not connected to the network is hurting them in terms of customer service, not answer, being able to address the questions on the status of orders. And it's also from an efficiency perspective on having to rekey or re-enter uh, or reduplicate order entry uh, for purchase order and collaboration. So it hurts them both from a, an execution perspective, but it's also hurting them in terms of product innovation. because there's a lot of collaboration that go on between a manufacturer and a supplier for new product introductions. And there's also a lot of new collaboration that goes on from customers on driving new product requirements and new demand requirements into the manufacturer. So from a collaboration and new product introduction perspective, from a product safety, from a sustainability issue, from a compliance requirement, uh, these are kind of the pain points that we're addressing. Um, if if somebody wanted to have a more meaningful conversation with you to learn more about uh, to see if Elemica is a fit, uh, is there a website? Yeah, the the, the website is Elemica dot com e l e m i c a dot com. Uh, they can uh, look at, look at the website or contact us directly. Well, David, thank you so much for sharing your story today. Congratulations on all your success. Oh, thank you very much for the opportunity to be on the show. I appreciate it. Thank you. All right. This is Lee Cantor. We will see you all next time on Atlanta Business Radio.